Thank God that I was, as he would even say, that uh, I was allowed to see the truth of Christianity. I had searched. I, I was raised as a Christian uh, to the best of my parents' ability of what they knew what a Christian was and what it meant to be a Christian. And yet in, in the middle of all of that and raised in church and that kind of thing, and yet there was a lot that I didn't see in church. And I didn't know I should have saw it because I didn't know what the Bible said. And then as I grew up, I started reading the Bible for myself. My mom taught me how to read by reading the King James, as most of you know. And so before I ever started school, we had read through the entire Bible several times. And so I didn't know it at the time. I, didn't, I wasn't trying to memorize it. But I, and I didn't know that God was putting it in me so that later he would be able to pull it out of me. And then as I grew up, and when I turned nine, I gave my life to Christ on purpose. I, I walked down the aisle. I did everything they said I should do to get born again, <clears throat> which means I was being obedient to what I knew to do, and that's when I got born again. And then from nine up to about 17, I knew that God was with me. I knew different things going on, but, you know, like any other kid growing up, I was like any other kid, you know, uh, to a large degree. And so when I turned 17, I had went into the military, went to the U.S. Air Force, and so I was a security police, law enforcement specialist. And so I was, my, my, I thought my path was charted. I thought that's the way it's going to be. Uh, I, I, did, I figured I would become a police officer like my dad had been. And I thought also that I would have a chain of martial arts schools because that was my, what I enjoyed doing. And I had already started teaching while I was in the Air Force and teaching foreign military. And so I uh, made, made some money on the side. Uh, because the Air Force didn't pay all that great, but I was making money on the side by teaching martial arts. And so then whenever God started dealing with me, he said, no, no, because he, he spared my life when I was a child. My mom and dad dedicated me to him when I was 17 months old, when I got hit by the car, if you've heard my testimony. And then when I was 17, God said, okay, you were dedicated to me, now I want you. And so he called me and I started, I started, now listen, I still didn't know that much. I mean, I knew some Bible, but it was based under the understanding that I had based on the groups we had been around. And so I didn't know much. I didn't know how it was supposed to work, you know, uh, pretty typical. And then started following him and, and knew that I was called to, to minister and tried to pursue that to a degree. And what does that mean? But nobody around me, now, little to my knowledge, you know, uh, my grandparents on my mother's side had been some of the early Pentecostal pioneers. And so they had been Pentecostal preachers that traveled around and, and just traveled all over the place, preaching the gospel, little tent meetings, and, and just that's how they lived their life. And I didn't know all that until later on. But then I started moving toward dedicating my life to God. And at the time, I was still, at that point, still in martial arts. And when I got out of the military, was teaching martial arts and thought I was still going to go that direction. Uh, became a corrections officer for the state of Texas, worked down at the Walls Unit here in Huntsville. And so I was, I was still, it's like I was living the life that I assumed everybody had to live, and yet at the same time, I was searching the Word of God and saying, okay, where do I go from here? How, I'm, I know I'm supposed to be preaching. How do I make that happen? And it seemed like the more I tried to make it happen, the less it happened. And so, but I just kept going forward now. But the bad part is I was up and down, up and down, up and down, according to the Word of God. Now, me, I thought I was just kind of living a normal life, but yet at the same time seeking how would I get into ministry, but at the same time not really focusing on ministry because I never wanted to earn my living in ministry. I just didn't care about that part of it. And so I started searching these things, and the Word started coming out. And then uh, during that time, I had gotten married right shortly after that. We also had our first child, and our first child was born with a hemangioma tumor, so she was in the hospital, and, and that just took our life on a totally different course because now everything was wrapped around making sure that we had the medical, you know, all the stuff for her. And so we had to fly her down to Galveston to John Seeley Hospital, and she was in intensive care for six months and didn't know if she was going to live or not live her. They had to put puncture, well, they had to put tubes in her sides because her lungs would collapse. 
and they had to pump her lungs back up. I mean, every day it was another thing. And every day it was, well, she <clears throat> might not live through the night. And this lasted for six months. And during that time, I still had to work a job. By that time, I had come back up to this area, and I was working at Texas Instruments, as a matter of fact, in the silicon chip department. And so I would work Monday through Friday and then jump on a plane or drive down to, to Galveston, I uh, usually drive down, and I would go down there and spend the weekend and then have to come back to work because we still had to have money coming in. And so that was our life for a while. And so we kept, during that time, some things started kind of coming back. And part of it had to do with all the stuff, the goofy stuff that people were telling me about why this had happened. You know, that, oh, God did this, and he did this, and he was doing this, and he was trying to teach us, and, oh, we must be really special people that God would trust us with this child that had this problem. And, and you know, I didn't know right or wrong. I just know that didn't sound right because all the stuff I'd heard about God. But at the same time, I'd heard a bunch of stuff about how God would smack you down and punish you and punish your kids for your sins and all that stuff. And so <clears throat> I started studying, getting in the Word. And then uh, about two years later, she passed away. Now, before she passed away, we had launched out, tried to launch out, actually did some good, traveled up to Tulsa, went to a camp meeting there, stayed around there for a week or two after, or about two weeks afterwards, and then went down to Sulphur, Louisiana, where we helped start a church there. And then, but it was just a small, I mean, it wouldn't have, you know, none of this was real organized, uh, but we were just doing what was in front of us. And then we went back to this area, came back home, and then on February 13th, our daughter passed away. On February 14th, we buried her just a few miles from here, actually. And, uh, you know, we, we were kind of, and then everybody tells us more stupid stuff. You know, God took your baby because of this and because of that. And, you know, he needed another flower in his garden and all that kind of stuff. And, and by, but the good thing is, by this time, we'd come into contact with a, a pastor that we started going to the church, and he gave me my first E.W. Kenyon book and my first Kenneth Copeland cassette tape. And so I listened to that, and that rocked my world. Because I didn't know, I'm like, where has this stuff been? I mean, why, why didn't I see this in the Bible before? And I started reading it and going into it, and I just started devouring it. I mean, just going after it. And then I started trying to find places. We'd go around. Now, before my daughter passed away, we went to every healing meeting, every healing conference, every camp meeting. I'd quit jobs if they wouldn't let me take off. I'd quit and drive my family there just so that the man of God could put his hand on my daughter. And we saw some advance. We saw some goodness come out of it. We saw a move toward healing where she was being healed. It was just taking too long. And then when she passed away, she passed away not of the, the cause of the, of the tumor or anything, but because of what was going around at the time was double pneumonia. And so we buried her because of that. But the, all that did was fire me up because I stood at that grave. And as most of you know, my testimony that we stood there. And I had called a lot of people, couldn't get a hold of anybody that could pray the prayer of faith or to raise the dead. And so when we stood there at that grave, uh, most of the rest of the family had already walked away. They expected us to walk away, but me and my wife stayed there. And when we stood there, I just told God, God, there was no man for me when I needed one. But if you will teach me the truth about your power and about healing, I'll be that man for somebody else so they don't have to have a grave like I do. And so that's launched us even further. I, I'm telling you, the more people tried to push back, the, the more I dug in my heels, and I got very obstinate about it. I mean, I was very, just people would say things, and I would just shut them down. Well, you know, well, you know, and then they would say, well, we'll see now how strong their faith is. And they, people expected us to fall away from God because they would blame God, and they expected us to. Thank God by that time I'd had enough good teaching that I didn't blame God for it, and I knew where to point the blame, and so we dug into the Word, dug in for truth, and then that's what led to, honestly, all of this today. It's because we wouldn't stop digging, we wouldn't stop, we didn't take just the canned answers that people had. Why? Because I wanted truth. And then when we found the truth, then I had to keep my Word and start sharing it. It wasn't easy. I got more flack for that than I did for believing that God didn't kill my daughter. And we got blasted on all fronts. We got blasted by family. We got blasted at people at church. And I'd start finding truth, and I'd start saying some of these things or asking the questions, and we would just get blasted over it. 
So I walked a long time by myself or maybe with just one friend or something that he didn't even agree with everything I was saying. But we st- I kept saying, this is what the Bible says. This is what the Bible says. And it doesn't say that. And this scripture <clears throat> denies what they said, so I had to go by the scripture. So it, w- it was not easy. It was, and it wasn't fun. It's lonely. And, and then the devil works on you. What makes you think you're right? What makes you think that all these people, they're smart, they're godly, they know God. Why do you see it and they don't? So, I mean, I had to fight through all of that stuff, and I always had to go back to, but the Word says, the Bible says. See, they had theory, they had experience, I had Scripture. And that's what I kept going after, and I kept going back to that. And so it kept moving. Now, in saying that, the whole point was that what we found out was that with us as Christians, I found out that we have light, we have light, and we have love. And the other religions didn't have that. And while I was in martial arts, I had studied other religions. I was raised Christian, but but because of the martial arts and the Eastern influence, I studied other things. And then whenever I started studying the Bible for myself and really going after it, I started studying these other things too because I wanted truth. And I said, if the Bible's true, it'll be true. And if it's not, toss it. And if the Jehovah Witnesses had truth, believe that. And my mother-in-law was a Jehovah Witness. And we had some serious discussions. And we would go back and forth over these things. And I, I studied various other religions instead of, you know, is there truth in them? And I've gone through all this stuff. I, I've studied all of the major religions, you know, of the world, basically, uh, to the depth to where I could, to the point where I proved them wrong. And when I proved them wrong, I said, okay, there's no more need to study that. And so then I would go and look at something else. At the same time, I always knew that the Bible was the thing that I was comparing them all against. Even if I wasn't trying to, I knew that that was there because I would read what they would say and then a scripture would come up in my mind. And I'm like, yeah, well, yeah, well what about that? And so I went through all this stuff. And so, and I proved those other things wrong. And then I started going into uh, what Paul, really studying what Paul said. And he said that if Christ is not raised, then we of all men are most miserable. Why? Because we're living our lives in vain. Listen, the resurrection is what makes the difference. We're the only religion, the only faith, the only, however you want to say it, the only connection to God that has a resurrection in it. That the founder came and showed us how to live and then died, left us an inheritance, left, left us his will, and then rose from the dead and ever lives just to make sure that his will is enforced. Now, others, none of the others did that. Jesus said, I am the way. Buddha said, I don't know the way. I'm trying to point the way. Well, why listen to a person that doesn't know the way whenever you can follow the one that is the way, right? And then you got, then you got other religions where the people in them and that founded them were posers. They liked the idea of a resurrection, so they tried to manufacture one. But the bottom line is, all the founders of these others, they're either in their graves or we know where they were buried, but Jesus' grave is empty. Amen? Why? Because he is life. The Bible is the only book that is self-fulfilling. It has prophecies and these things, and if you stand on it, it will come to pass. The other books don't do that. The other books don't have that life in them. But the Word of God is not just in ink, but it is living. Amen? And if it's living and you hook on to it, you will live too. It's that simple. Why? Because it is the word of God that points you toward Jesus and he is the life. 